Okay, let's uh, start uh, this lecture. Uh, I will uh, go through the solution for assignment two. Uh, you got some uh, uh, the results and uh, some comments uh, this weekend. And I will now go through the different sub-problems and try to, well, at least shortly, to, uh, to show how, how an answer on, on the problems could be. Uh, and then I will also present assignment number three, which is to be delivered in three weeks. And then we will continue on uh, uh, inventory theory with uh, uh, deterministic demand. And uh, uh, well in particular, we will look at uh, uh, discounts and different types of discount. But first, uh, I'm asked from the people administering the HI Molde X, the video recording of the lecture, that uh, you should take a survey because some students on uh, the survey design course have uh, uh, well developed a survey for uh, students. You can find it by choosing um, HIML the X. Where you can use that? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I can't find the, the link now. It should be on the first page, as uh, far as I know. Here. And uh, HI Molde X, you can use uh, from, from the front page of the uh, college's web page. You can choose uh, this one and uh, go to the Sister Nyheter. This is Norwegian, last news. And then find this questionnaire, spørre undersøkelse, and then you're asked to, uh, to answer uh, this one. Takes only a few minutes. Um, response quest back here. And also we can see the video from the students doing this uh, survey. Which was without sound. Okay, anyway, we'll uh, don't use much time on that, but uh, you're asked to, uh, to answer this uh, survey about how you uh, feel uh, on uh, uh, using this HIML X and the video recording. Is it useful for you, both you students who are here at the, the lectures physically and also those who are following the, the course on, uh, on the video lectures? Okay, let's then go back to the curriculum in the course and uh, in particular the assignment number two and we uh, I have also in addition to giving you some uh, some personal feedback to your uh, answers uh, uploaded this solution both in uh, as a PDF file where you can see the answers to each of the sub problems but also I have uploaded a uh, an Excel file where you have all the calculations, uh, where you uh, can also see how you can use the cell references and copy references from one cell to the other, because it is, of course, much easier to copy a formula from uh, one cell to, to the others instead of uh, just uh, defining formula for, for each cell. So this is should be quite easy if you know how to use uh, uh, Excel. So here you have an example of how you can answer the different sub problems on, uh, on problem number one about the forecasting. Uh, and also I have uh, for the problem two, you had some lingo questions and all there you have also uploaded uh, this uh, lingo file which can be solved to optimality with the different types of constraints in, in the different sub problems here. But uh, let's now first go through quite fast the solution from the PDF file. And here we are first asked to use data from 2002 to 2003, create a model and forecast the demand for all the months in 2004 with this model. And then first we'll find the mean or the average on the two separate seasons, which now is 2002 and 2003. So use a spreadsheet, calculate the average like this, 
And then you will find the slope or the gradient, the initial gradient, G0, as the difference between the mean of the two seasons, the two full year, divided by the number of periods in one season. In this case, uh, in this case the, the difference between the average on 2003 and uh, 2002 divided by 12, the number of months. This is the expected change of the trend line from one period to the next period. And in this case, we can see that we actually have a negative trend because 2003 has a lower average than 2002. And when we know the initial slope, the G0 value, we can also find the initial uh, va uh, value of the series at time zero, which is the end point of the line. You here we have uh, we have a graph which looks more like this. We have 2002 values, and we have 2003 values. And now this is time zero, where we are now and where we are now forecasting from, and then we have found the trend line, which actually should be uh, negative, as we, we can see. And now we will find the point here, which is the S0, the end point of the trend line, for which should be used for forecasting. And then you will just try to continue this line and adjust by the seasonal factors. Because you have different demand, uh, different percentage demand from uh, for January, February, and up to December for each of the 12 months. And when we know these two values, the G0 and the S0, initial value of the gradient and the slope, in this case, minus 15,000 and 448,000 for the, uh, the, the series value, we can also find the initial seasonal factors by using this formula here. This will then uh, define the percentage deviation from the trend line for each of the 12 months from January to December. And then we will find for each month in 2002 and each month in 2003, we have a different percentage value we need to find the average of those because we should now have one seasonal factor for each month. And when we have the average, we can we here see that we actually have a different sum, which is not exactly like 12, the number of periods. And then we used to uh, we have to normalize by using the normalization factor. We say that this is. 12 divided by 12.6797, which is 0 0.9464. And multiply each of the seasonal factors by this normalization factor to make sure that we have uh, exactly the number of uh, periods in, um, in the sum of all the, the seasonal factors. When we now have these values, we have the initial slope, we have the initial value of the series, we have the seasonal factors normalized for each of the month, we can use the formula shown here to make a forecast. Forecast for one particular period in advance. This is the tau, Greek letter tau, which is the number of period to forecast for, will be the seasonal, uh, the this value of the series, the S0, this one, plus tau, the number of periods to uh, forecast in advance, multiplied by the gradient. So if you are forecasting for January 2004, multiply gradient by one. For February, multiply by two, and so on. And then adjust this value by the seasonal factors, which, which will tell you the percentage uh, deviation from the trend line for that particular season. And we will have a forecast which looks like this. And the actual numbers are shown here. So now in this sub-problem, we are at 
uh, the, uh, the end of the year 2003 and will forecast for all the months in 2004 by using the value of the series as the, the basis and then using the initial gradient as the expected trend line for the coming year. For problem B, we now should update this estimate of the series, the gradient and the seasonal factors for each month in 2004, when the demand of the previous month is known. So now we still have this situation here. We are, we have initialized this forecasting method as we did in problem A. Then we will forecast for January, <coughs> which would now naturally will be exactly the same as in problem A. But then we have to uh, look at the actual demand in January to see that, okay, we expected the demand to be at this point, but the actual demand was actually here, even lower. And then we need to adjust the values of the series we will continue this line, but then it will not continue with the same slope. It might be a lower value. So now we will find the S1 value here, the new value of the series. We also have to adjust the gradient, the G parameter, because now the expected growth will be different because the demand, the actual demand, was different from the uh, forecasted demand. That means that the slope or the gradient will be different. We have to adjust for each new month. So when we get the data or the, the actual values for January, we will update the S value, the G value, and also the C value, the seasonal factor and then make a new forecast for February. When the data for February is known, update the S, G and C values and make a new forecast for March and so on. And here, the formulas to use for, up use for updating is uh, this shown here, uh, which is uh, the smoothing constant, alpha, beta and gamma, which is the some kind of importance of the newest measured value compared to the previous forecast. So when alpha is equal to 0 0.2, the newest demand, which is the D parameter, is multiplied by 0 0.2 and of course adjusted by the seasonal factor. And then we have 0 0.8 left, 1 minus 0 0.2, which is multiplied by the actual uh, by the forecast which was made in the previous period. So for every month we should now update these three values. Uh, apparently I uh, did one thing wrong in a previous lecture because when we looked at the, the formula here for updating the seasonal uh, or initializing the, the seasonal value uh, I seem to have said that we should use n plus 1 instead of n minus 1. This is the correct. This is also what is in the, uh, in, in the textbook. And I will also try to explain why this is so. Because here, to find the end point of the line here, we should take... Yeah, let's assume the first season is here, and then we should find the average for the second season, 2003 which is in the V2 parameter, the V2 value will be at one particular point of the trend line. So if we have an increasing trend here, this is for 2000, uh, would be for 2003, and the V2 value will be the midpoint of this line. To get to the end point where we should have the S0, we need to multiply the trend because we have found the trend, which is the increase or eventually in this case, the decrease from month to month. Multiply by n minus one divided by two. Uh, the reason for n minus one is since we have 12 months, the midpoint of the line should be exactly in the middle here. 
and the midpoint of a line uh, of 12 different point, points will be 6.5. You start at 1 and you end at 12. So this one, this value, the G2 value, no, the, the V2 value, sorry, is the midpoint of the line here. And to get from the midpoint at, uh, at the time uh, month 6.5, to the end point at 12, you have to add 5.5, which is 12 minus 1 divided by 2. So that's the reason we should use n minus 1 here. We should add 5.5 in our case to get to the end point here. In some other formulas, uh, for example, uh, when we are using regression, we are going the other way. We still find the midpoint of the line, and we are going the other way to meet the y-axis. And then we are actually using n plus 1 instead of n minus 1. And that is because we will start in a series of values. We will start on 1 and end at the number of periods here, which is 12. And if we are going from v0 and back in 5.5, we will actually end up at 1. But if we should find the intersection of the y-axis, we have to add one more. So in this case, if we are going from the midpoint to the y-axis, we should use n plus 1. But if we are going to the midpoint to the end point, we have to use n minus 1. So that's uh, uh, an explanation for this. Th uh, so some groups have done thi this wrong. This was not. I this is not a big mistake. I haven't actually uh, drawn any points. I have commented it. If you have used n plus one instead of n minus one, but the correct is n minus one, and you should also try to understand why. Okay, back to question. Okay, uh, back to this problem of uh, forecasting now on B, uh, on, on uh, problem 1B, we should now here update the S, the G and the C for all months when you know the exact <laughs> demand. So here, is this is also taken from the Excel uh, file which is uh, uploaded in, in Fronter with the calculations. Start with the initial values of S and G. Register the January demand, update all these values, and then make a new forecast. Register the February demand, update the S, G, and C, make a new forecast, and so on. And this will now be the adjusted forecast by using the updating method for with the, with the, the smoothing constants uh, here. <coughs> And then we will get the values shown here. We should also, when you, uh, ideally you should actually norm the seasonal factors every time you're changing one of them, but here I have uh, uh, done the normalization when every, uh, every month is updated here. What is important is when you are doing a forecast is that you should actually use the old seasonal factors not the updated one for the forecast, and that's of course because you don't know the value of the updated forecast. If you should forecast for January, you should use the old January seasonal factor. If you should forecast for February, you should use the old seasonal factor for February because the updated values will not be known until the end of that particular month. So even if you are here updating the C value to the new value here, for doing the forecast, you have to use the old one. Because this updating is not done before you know the exact demand for that system. If we are comparing the two forecasting methods, we can see this graph, which uh, show that uh, here the actual demand is uh, this uh, pink line. The blue line is the first forecast for the first month, and the 
yellow line is the uh, is the for, uh, forecast for which is updated for each, each month. And what we can see here is that the yellow and the pink line are following each other best in the 11 first month of the year, but then you have some problem in forecasting in December because for some reason this product had a very low sale in December compared to the forecast. It was pretty high, it was higher than the annual forecast made at the end of the previous year, which is the blue line, for all the first uh, month in here, but in December we had a quite uh, significant uh, lower demand than actually what we should expect according to, to the trend for the previous year, for, for the, the previous month. So here the forecast for each month what was better for almost all the month, but we have a quite huge deviation here at the end of, um, of this period, which is in uh, uh, at the end of this year, which is in December. Then we are also asked to show a value or a graph with the values of the gradient, the G values, what we can see here. We have, we start at a negative value, minus 15,000, and then we get a higher value, but still it is negative until month number four here, which means that we start with a negative trend, this, and the trend will increase but still be negative until we reach April. And then it will be slightly positive but not very much, slightly above zero. And then again it will decrease and be negative in May and June and in July we will also pass the zero point and, and have a slightly positive trend for that particular month. And then the trend will start to decrease pretty much. And we can see here that in December it's very, uh, very low here. So we have a quite significant negative trend. So from July we will decrease pretty much. And the sales is uh, decreasing according to what we are uh, expecting and, and what we are uh, have, have been uh, using in, in the forecast. So something is happening at the end of December for this product. Maybe it's a, another uh, console which is uh, uh, coming to the market at that point, uh, which m makes uh, the sales in December very low compared to uh, previous uh, years. And then on problem E, we are asked to use the data available by the end of 2004 to make a forecast for 2005. Which means that we should now continue and we should not do a new initialization process, but we should continue with the values for S and G, which is found in December 2004, which we have from problem B. So here, use the values here because we don't need to initialize again. These values are actually or should be more relevant because they have now been updated month for month for every period for the last years. And these values should now be the new values to be used for forecasting the next year. Then we will end up with this forecast and this is done the same way as we did in problem 1a. Start with a series value and a gradient value and use the updated uh, seasonal factors which we have found in problem b when we update it month for month and make a forecast for all the month in 2005. And then we can see when comparing with the actual demand is that the actual demand is higher than the forecast all over the year. So something is happening here again to see that uh, the, uh, the demand for this product is starting to increase again. 
because the very low trend at the end of 2004 will not continue with the same uh, in the same scale. It will be well, it will increasing and also will be increasing at uh, over the year here. So the neg negative trend is uh, is not continuing in in the same rate. It will be a, a higher demand than we actually have found by forecasting. And we will, if this was not asked for in, in the problem, but if we had used a month for month updating on this data, we will see that the trend by updating month for month would be, um, uh, would be able to find this uh, change of the trend earlier in this month and be able to adjust the forecast according to the higher demand over the year. So then let's continue to problem two about aggregate planning. And uh, here we have uh, first, we are asked about the production plan for the company using the chase strategy. And we remember the chase strategy or the zero inventory strategy is uh, a strategy where we should always aim to have as small inventory as possible, ideally down to zero inventory, no inventory at all. You should adjust the workforce, number of workers, according to what we actually need in each period. So here we can see the two yeah, uh, A was the zero inventory strategy or the chase strategy, and B was the constant workforce strategy, which is the opposite strategy, where you aim to have a constant workforce, and then you will have to deal with a lot of inventory on, uh, uh, on stock. With the zero inventory strategy, first we need to find the K factor, which is the how much one worker will produce in one day. And it's formed by using historical data, 125,000 units produced by 1,000 employees in 250 days. Historical data says that each, uh, each worker will produce one half of a product each day. And then for the zero inventory strategy, find the minimum number of workers required here by dividing the demand, what we actually need, to the units per worker. And now it is the K factor multiplied by the number of production days in that particular month. So here we can find that to produce 800 units, 8,000 units in January, we need 728 workers. To produce 6,000 in February, we need 667, because here we have less number of working days, and similar for all these months. And since we are starting with 1,000 workers, we have to fire 272 in January, and then we have to fire 61 more in February, and then we are starting to hire more workers in March, April, May, and June. A total, this will be 733 hires and 333 uh, firing in this six months. Uh, this is called the zero inventory strategy, but we will not achieve exactly zero inventory, but this is a very small amount and very close to zero. And it's also possible to reduce it even more by uh, looking at what you actually have on stock here in inventory and comparing with the units per workers in this column. And when this number is higher than this number, we can save one worker by using inventory from stock instead of using one worker to produce. This is not included in, in this solution, but it's also important to, to be aware of. So here, this strategy would give us 703 hiring at a cost of 300, 333 firing at a cost of 600, 76 units on stock, and the problem description says that we should also have 2,000 at the end of June. This is included here. 
so these should also be included in the inventory cost and the cost per unit is 50. So here the cost for this strategy is 523,500. That's the zero inventory strategy, one or the chase strategy, one of the extreme strategies. <coughs> the other one, which is the opposite, is the constant workforce. Here we should find out how many workers do we need for production in what we call the, the critical month. And there, find the ratio, which is the cumulative demand, the demand up to that particular point, divided by the cumulative units per workers. So here we find the cumulative by adding each, uh, the each uh, of these uh, uh, month uh, values for, for the month in the units per worker and the demand and divide the cumulative demand by the cumulative number of units per worker, find the ratio and choose the highest ratio, which in this case is, is at the last month in June, and a total of 1,000. And as we remember, we had also 1,000 employees at the start of January, which means that here we don't need to hire or fire anyone. So we have no costs on changing the workforce, but we have rather high inventory cost because we are producing many units at the start of the periods, uh, at the start of, of this uh, time uh, horizon, and we are producing and storing, and we are actually using them at the end of the time horizon here. So here we will have, have a very high inventory cost for storing inventory, and this strategy is much more expensive than the zero inventory strategy in this case. Then continue, problem C. We should now define an LP problem, a linear programming problem for this particular situation. First, explain the constraint sets. And the first set here is the balancing constraint for the workforce. We have to make sure because this linear programming problem is to be solved by a, uh, a solver. We are using Lingo, or you could also use the, the solver in Excel or any other um, optimizer program. But then, since we're using uh, a mathematical methods in a data program, we need to define this very thoroughly to make sure that the workforce is, uh, uh, well, uh, from one month to the next, is uh, uh, similar to comparing to the previous month and the change of workforce by hiring and firing. So this is the constraint set that will make sure that the, the workforce is consequent. The second constraint set is uh, making sure that we are, uh, we are producing according to the given demand and what is different will be adjustment of the inventory of the stock. The third constraint sets uh, will here make sure that the production is according to the production per month for one person and multiplied by the number of workers employed. And then at last we have constraints that are given the initial values in the problem description. Number of workers is 1000, inventory on stock is 2000, and inventory at the end of June should be 2,000. Here I've set larger than or equal to 2,000 because this could be some slight uh, uh, differences there. Uh, well, the policy is that they should have at least 2,000 at the end of, uh, of June. <coughs> Looking at the solution of the LP problem by uh, solving it in Lingo, it will look like this. Objective function is 300 multiplied by the number of hiring, plus 600 multiplied by the number of firing, and plus 50 multiplied by the number of units on stock on every month. And here we find an optimal solution which has the value 496,923, which is lower than both the extreme strategies much lower than the constant workforce strategy, 
uh, but also lower than the, the zero inventory or the chase strategy. Uh, the, well, what we can call the problem here is that we have actually a fractional number of workers. We say that we have 727.2727 number of workers, which is not actually uh, relevant. But here, as a linear program, we will deal with these fractions, at least so far, and we will look at the integer values later in this, uh, in this problem. So here we can find that the optimal solution found by mathematical methods by a data program is to fire 272.72 in January, then 9.32 in uh, February, no changes in March, and then we have some, some hiring in the other months uh, here. Uh, comparing, we can see that zero inventory gives uh, 523,000, constant workforce 1,525,000, 1, much more expensive, and the LP solution is not very far from the zero inventory, but it is even lower here by finding the optimal solution, which is different from any of the extreme values. So on problem F, try to find some, uh, some situations for the three, uh, three possible situations here. Try to uh, describe and, and find some examples. One is when you have a very high hiring cost compared to the others. This can, uh, of, co uh, yeah, well of course, there are lots of different examples here. And uh, uh, this is not uh, extensive in, in any way, but this is some, some examples on, on this. This can happen, for example, in a country like China, when you have a large economic growth and some kind of poorness, and the pressure on the labor markets is very high hiring cost compared to the other types of costs. It's not, uh, not very costly to fire a person. It's just to well kick that person out of the, the company. Uh, it's, not, it's also often quite cheap products. And you don't have much unions and, and work laws, which makes it easy to, to fire a person. Uh, here, the second example, when you have high firing cost compared to the others, is typically in a country like Norway or the Western uh, countries, where you have high union tradition and makes firing very costly and very uh, difficult, even if the products have a high value. And the third example here, when you have large inventory cost compared to the other types of cost is when you have very high valued products. Examples, airplanes, ships, specialized medical equipments and so on. And then the products markets with very high needs for expensive handling may imply extreme inventory cost compared to the other two cost factors here. So when we are using lingo, Simulating these three situations, we can use this file here and multiply each of these costs by 10. And we can see that if we are multiplying the inventory cost by 10, we will have an inventory uh, a, a solution with zero inventory, no inventory, because the cost of storing inventory is so high. Similar, if we are, instead of multiplying the inventory cost by 10, we can uh, multiply either the hiring or the firing cost with 10. We will have a solution which is equal to, you can see here, this is the exactly same value as we found by using the uh, constant workforce solution. No hiring, no firing, and you have inventory <coughs> in each of the six months. So you are producing inventory even if it's costly because it's even more costly to do changes at the workforce when you have to pay much for hiring and firing. Okay, I will, uh, before we take a break, I will uh, shortly show the answers for the remaining sub-problems. Next is uh, about uh, having limitation in stock, and here we also 
need to re reduce the stock at the incoming, uh, uh, the incoming stock from, from December. It used to be 2,000, now it's reduced because of space to 500. And also you have all also to deal with 500 at, at the end inventory here. So in this case, you are not able to find a solution where you are storing much inventory from the next period, uh, from one period to the next, but because of the uh, limited number of uh, inventory on stock here and also on stock at, at the end, this will be a cheaper solution than the optimal, uh, optimal solution because the, the constraints are changed. So here we can see that the inventory level will always be less than 500 and you will have some adjustment to the workforce shown in this solution here. Similar on problem I, we have new constraints now according to the workforce. In this case, you have 800 permanent workers who cannot be fired and the remaining workers are uh, what can be fired. There are temporary workers. Can be hired for one month and not hired for the next month. But the number of workers needs to be 800 at every point here because they are permanent. Then you will have a bit uh, a more costly situation because you are not able to reduce the workforce here. You can only from December to January you can get rid of 200 but you need to keep the remaining number of workers which means that you might have to plan with, uh, with uh, some inventory. You have to produce for inventory even if that was not, not uh, exactly the, the optimal solution if the number of workers were not, uh, um, were not uh, limited to be at least 800. And before we take the break, last question here about integer numbers. Now we cannot use um, fractional number of workers. Then we will introduce these type of constraints, which says that the number of workers, the W123456, should be an integer number. And since the number of workers is integer, then automatically the number of the hiring and the firing will also be integer numbers. This constraints might be some kind of dangerous because they will make the complexity of this problem much more, uh, it, it, the problem will be much more complex by using integer constraints here. And you can suddenly come in a situation where even Lingo or any other uh, optimizer are able to find a solution, a feasible solution within reasonable time. In this case, it is possible and we can get a solution which is very close to the optimal solution here and only using integer numbers. Okay, then we take 15 minutes break and then I will continue on the, the curriculum on inventory uh, <coughs> management when with a fixed or deterministic demand.